So let's look at our first nonlinear filter, and that's the extended comma filter. Now, this filter comes in two versions, you might say, the normal one, and then there's an iterative solution, similar to what we do when we solve an optimization problem using a Gauss-Newton search. The extended comma filter was developed shortly after the comma filter in the early 1960s. And the basic idea is simple and natural. Now, if we have nonlinear models, fk minus 1 and hk, why don't we simply linearize these? And now that we have linear models again, we know how to handle these, and that is to use the comma filter. So in the prediction step, we linearize our nonlinear motion model around our posterior estimate from the previous time instance and use a normal comma filter prediction. Now, why do we use the posterior mean from the previous time instance as our linearization point? Well, our motion model is a function of xk minus 1. And our best guess of what xk minus 1 is when we do the prediction is our posterior mean. So naturally, we want our linearization to be as accurate as possible at or near where we think xk minus 1 actually is. Now, for the update step, we basically do the same thing. We will linearize hk of xk, but as the measurement model is a function of xk, we use our predicted estimate, x hat k given k minus 1, as a linearization point, and then use the comma filter update with this linearized model. Now, let's look at what we mean by linearization in a filtering context by considering a Gaussian random variable x, which mean x hat and covariance p, and then an additional random variable y, which is dependent on x through this nonlinear function g, like this. So what we want to do is to first linearize our nonlinear model, and we do this by using a first-order Taylor expansion of g of x around the mean of x, which is x hat. So if we try to illustrate this in the scalar case, we have two random variables, x and y. They are mapped by this nonlinear function g. Now, we know that x is Gaussian with mean x hat, and variance p. Now we can illustrate this by drawing a Gaussian density here on the x-axis. Now this density is basically transformed through our nonlinear function to get p or y. That could perhaps look something like this. The mean gets transformed to here, minus one standard deviation gets transformed to here, and plus one standard deviation gets transformed to here. So if we draw this, what we see is that we no longer have our nice bell shape here, so we have something else here. So this is not a Gaussian density anymore. So what we instead want to do is we want to linearize g using a first-order Taylor expansion around x hat. That is, around the point where p of x has the most probability mass. So if we're going to choose one point, I'm thinking that this is a pretty good one. Now, the first-order Taylor expansion is g x hat, which is this point plus the Jacobian of g evaluated at x hat, which in our scalar case is just the slope of g at the mean. And we multiply this by this factor here, which is x minus x hat. So this part here is zero at the point x hat. So we get this linear function. Now with this approximation of g, we can approximate p or y as a Gaussian, which is a result of transforming x through this linear function. And we get something like this which is fairly close in this case, but not exactly p of y. So this is our Gaussian approximation of p of y using this linearized model. Now, we should note that g prime of x is, in general, the Jacobian matrix of g, where the ij element of this matrix is the partial derivative of the ith row of g with respect to the jth component of x. So this here is a m by n matrix where m is the dimension of y and n is the dimension of x. Now, as this is a linear mapping, we can simply calculate the mean and covariance of this Gaussian approximation like this. And it's easy to verify that this holds true. So the expected value of y, is simply if we insert this expression here, so it's the expected value of Now, only x is stochastic in this expression, and the mean of x is x hat, which means that the expected value of this part is zero. So the only thing we have left is the expected value of g of x hat, which is deterministic, so this is just g of x hat. For the covariance, we have again that the covariance of y is equal to the covariance of, again, this expression here.
So the covariance of this is zero. And this is also deterministic, so we can move that outside of the covariance. So we get Now the covariance here is simply p, right? So get this expression here. Now try this yourself. What is g of x hat and g prime of x hat when x is this random vector here and x hat has this value here and the g is this nonlinear mapping here? So if we use this in our extended comma filter, we start with a prediction step where we assume that we have a Gaussian posterior from the previous time instance where we have the mean x hat k minus 1 given k minus 1 and the covariance p k minus 1 given k minus 1. Now, if we linearize our nonlinear motion model using a first order Taylor expansion around the posterior mean from the previous time instance, we get the following linear expression as an approximation of our nonlinear motion model. As we saw on the previous slide, by using this approximation for our motion model, we can simply calculate the predicted mean x hat of k given k minus 1 by propagating our posterior mean from the previous time instance through our nonlinear function. And finally, our predicted covariance is calculated like this, as we also saw on the previous slide, but we need to add qk minus 1 here, which is the covariance of our process noise. Now, if we call our Jacobian matrix here as f tilde, it's just a matrix, and this is then f tilde transpose, we see that we get something that is very similar to what we had in the prediction step in the comma filter. Similarly, for the update step, we approximate our nonlinear measurement model using first order Taylor expansion around the predicted mean that we just calculated. If we use this linear model in the update equations of the comma filter, we get the following expressions. Note that the only difference compared to the normal comma filter update equations is that we calculate the predicted measurement by evaluating h at the predicted mean and that the Jacobian matrix of h enters here, here, and here instead of the measurement model matrix. However, although the equations look similar both in the prediction step and in the measurement update step, there is a clear and important difference. The comma filter calculates the true mean and covariance of the predicted and posterior distribution, whereas the extended comma filter only finds them approximately.